Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. So we have the honor and privilege of being joined by the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration of Ghana, uh, Her Excellency Shirley Ayorkor Botchwe. Uh, we are also joined, sitting next to her, by Atul Kare, the Under Secretary uh, General for Operational Support, and also uh, by Catherine Pollard, the Under Secretary General for Management Strategy, Policy, and Compliance. We will also be joined by Jean-Pierre Lacroix, uh, the head of our Peace Operations Department. He is delayed, but he will uh, join us uh, in a, just a few minutes. Uh, and today's theme for this press conference is the Peacekeeping Ministerial, which is scheduled to be held in Accra in December, and you will hear a lot more about it. Uh, Minister, you have the floor. Or you could have spoken from here too, uh, it's, uh, or from the chair. But whatever feels more comfortable to you, that is totally fine. I'm already up, so mm -hmm. thank you so much. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the United Nations media. I am pleased to be here with Mr. Jean-Pierre Lacroix, who is on his way here, Under Secretary General for Peace Operations. Ms. Catherine Pollard, Under Secretary General for Management, Strategy, Policy, and Compliance, and Mr. Atu Kerr, Under Secretary General for Operational Support for this afternoon's joint press conference, which is on the upcoming 2023 United Nations Peacekeeping Ministerial Meeting. It is my honor to announce to you that the 2023 UN Peacekeeping Ministerial Meeting will be held in Accra, Ghana. And it will be held from the 5th to 6th of December, 2023. The ministerial meeting in Ghana would be the fifth meeting since its inception in 2014, and the first to take place on the continent of Africa. The meeting will bring together all member states represented in the Special Committee on Peacekeeping, C-34, and is aimed at strengthening UN peacekeeping in line with the Secretary General's Action for Peacekeeping and the A4P+. Specifically, the meeting will provide an opportunity to explore ways by which member states can generate high-performing and specialized capabilities and other pledges that meet UN needs, as well as new or expanded sustainable capacity building, training, and equipping partnerships in key areas. The 2023 ministerial meeting will focus on five key themes. Number one is protection of civilians. Number two, strategic communications, which includes misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech. Number three is safety and security. Number four is the mental health of peacekeepers. And number five is women in peacekeeping. In the lead up to the Accra meeting, Four preparatory meetings were scheduled to be held in line with the selected themes. The first two preparatory meetings comprising women in peacekeeping and the safety and security of peacekeepers were held in Dhaka, Bangladesh and Islamabad, Pakistan, respectively. The one on mental health of peacekeepers was held remotely. And the last one on strategic communications is scheduled to, be, to take place in Kigali, Rwanda from the 23rd to 24th of October, 2023. The ministerial meeting in Accra is taking place at the level of foreign and defense ministers. And we have encouraged participating member states to indicate in advance their peacekeeping pledges which is essential in enhancing the responsiveness of peacekeeping to the security challenges of our time. Additionally, the pledges will feed into the outcome of the ministerial. 
distinguished members of the media. Before I conclude, I wish to inform you that preparations are far advanced for the event in Accra, and several milestones have been achieved. A dedicated website, www.accra2023pkm.mfa.gov.gh with a registration link and information on the PKM is available. And the logistical note for the ministerial meeting will be circulated to member states by the close of next week. I seize this opportunity to reaffirm my invitation to all delegations to be in Accra for the first ever UN peacekeeping ministerial meeting to be held on the continent of Africa. We look forward to seeing some of you also in Accra in December and to supporting our efforts towards the success of the event. I thank you for your kind and attention. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to uh, Atul Kare. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, friends from the press corps, let me begin by first and foremost conveying our sincerest appreciation and grateful thanks to the government of Ghana, through the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Her Excellency, Ms. Shirley Ayorkor Bochwe, for all the preparatory work that has already been undertaken for the peacekeeping ministerial. The ministerial is an event that best embodies the transformational power of partnerships. It provides a unique opportunity to create and to strengthen partnerships to enhance peacekeeping abilities. In fact, uh, the United Nations Triangular Partnership Program, which provides engineering, medical, C4ISR uh, courses to thousands of uh, uniformed peacekeepers, is a direct outcome of the 2014 Leaders' Summit on UN peacekeeping, which preceded the ministerials. Apart from training and capacity building, I hope the safety and security of peacekeepers will receive special attention, as already indicated by Her Excellency the Minister. I look forward to discussions and pledges that will support efforts that ensure our uniformed personnel have access to right equipment and training necessary to fulfill their assignment safely. We must continue to take active steps towards enhancing the safety of men and women who serve on the ground, including protection against explosive threats, improved casualty evacuations, and emergency medical care. We must also fully embrace technological innovations to improve our medical care. Our telemedicine project, now operational at 24 medical facilities across some of the most high-risk missions, allows peacekeepers in remote locations to receive high-quality medical care. We are also working towards gender-sensitive medical care and making it more accessible as part of our ongoing efforts to increase women's participation in peacekeeping. Protecting the well-being of our peacekeepers, dear friends, would be incomplete without psychological medical care. To this end, the United Nations is developing a strategic framework for mental health support for uniformed personnel. Finally, I hope that environmental management will receive increased attention at the ministerial. Several efforts are ongoing from deploying renewable energy systems, reducing water consumption to minimizing waste generation in our operations. I hope that many countries will participate in the side event on environment, which will be held on 5th December, and discuss possible innovative partnerships to contribute to the efforts of the United Nations and the troop and police contributing countries to meet the environmental goals of the organization. Dear friends, ministerial success will depend on the meaningful participation of member states. Her Excellency the Minister has already invited all member states to participate therein, and I hope to see as many member states participate as possible and would like to again thank Ghana as our generous host for the 2023 UN Peacekeeping Ministerial and all the co-chairs of this process for their ongoing support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Catherine Pollard, and then we will conclude afterwards uh, the opening statements with Mr. Lacroix. Please go ahead. 
ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I'd first like to express my appreciation to Ghana, the government of Ghana as host for the 2023 UN Peacekeeping Ministerial, and to also express my appreciation and thanks to the Foreign Minister, Ms. Shirley Bochway, to be with us here this afternoon. The event will once again afford member states the opportunity to express their collective commitments to strengthening UN peacekeeping. As you're all aware, the ministerial has played an important role in advancing the Women in Peacekeeping agenda. We therefore welcome in this regard the side event on enhancing women's participation in UN peacekeeping, the role of gender responsive leaders. We expect that member states will make significant pledges in this area. It's important to point out that in addition to the many challenges currently before us, United Nations peace operations are also at a critical juncture in preventing and addressing misconduct as a central element of performance, and that this is a collective endeavor. The ministerial frames conduct and discipline through the lens of partnership. We hope that this will enable us to develop new and to deepen existing partnerships with member states aimed at improving our efforts including on zero tolerance for sexual exploitation and abuse, and urgently addressing the many paternity and child support claims that arise from these destructive acts. We must do more in partnership with member states to address these issues, including through training, accountability, and adequate support to victims. All UN personnel are entitled to be treated with dignity and respect and are aware of their roles and responsibilities in maintaining a workplace free of any form of discrimination, harassment, including sexual harassment and abuse of authority. In this regard, troops and police contributing countries should, among others, commit to including dedicated pre-deployment training for all uniform personnel, including commanders, on these standards of conduct and further undertaking to integrate the UN reinforcement training program into pre-deployment training for commanders. As noted in the pledging guide, all member state pledges will be announced live during the ministerial. And I also look forward to contributions from member states into the trust fund for victims of sexual exploitation and abuse. Most importantly, I look forward to the discussion at the ministerial and also hearing from member states. In concluding, once again, to express a big thank you to the government of Ghana for being our generous host for the 2023 UN Peacekeeping Ministerial. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me now turn to Mr. Jean-Pierre Lacroix. Thank you uh, very much. Apologies for coming late, and uh, it's very good to be here uh, with the uh, her Excellency, uh, Foreign Minister of Ghana, uh, Ms. Shirley Bochui, and my colleagues, and the Secretary General Catherine Pollard and uh, USG Atulkari. Um, we look forward to this meeting in uh, Ghana. Uh, it uh, is a tradition that every other year we hold this uh, ministerial level on uh, peacekeeping. And uh, I want to uh, express my gratitude to uh, Ghana for uh, hosting this uh, important uh, event. And I want to uh, thank you, uh, Minister Bochwe, but also uh, your colleagues, uh, permanent representative of Ghana, here's Excellency Mr. Aro Agiman, for the good work in terms of uh, the uh, preparation of that meeting. Um, this is the first time that uh, peacekeeping ministerial level meeting will be held in uh, Africa. And we believe that uh, it is an important signal due to the uh, uh, presence of uh, uh, many peacekeeping operations in, in, in the continent of Africa, but also uh, in terms of the important contribution that uh, many African countries, and of course, including uh, very importantly so uh, your own country, Minister Ghana, uh, are uh, bringing to, to peacekeeping. Um, this meeting will have essentially two key objectives. One is to 
um, discuss the uh, key challenges that are being faced by peacekeeping operations and to look at uh, the efforts that are being made to overcome these challenges and to adapt peacekeeping uh, to the new environment, the new political environment and security environment in which it operates. And the second objective, which is related to the first one, is to register a pledge announcement by uh, troop and police contributing countries, by participants, um, so that uh, we can have, our peacekeeping operation can have the capacities that they need to continue performing their duties. Um, we uh, shared with the member states uh, uh, in order for them to prepare their pledges uh, what I call the shopping list, uh, the, the pledging guide that lists the, uh, the needs uh, that we have, the gaps that we have, um, so that a uh, member state can uh, prepare uh, pledges that will be uh, consistent with our critical needs. The, um, uh, the, chef, the sessions that will uh, take place during the meeting will cover important issues such as uh, capabilities for mandate delivery and ensuring effective operations, including protection, <coughs> safety and security and technology. Capacity building and training, including a, a very important topic, which is the mental health of our colleagues in the field. Conditions for success, including host government support, inclusion, conduct, and strategic communication. There will also be two side events on equally important topics such as improving the environmental impact of peacekeeping and further enhancing women's participation in UN peacekeeping. Now, um, as you probably know, there has been uh, already three uh, preparatory meetings uh, in the run-up to the uh, Accra meeting. I want to thank the uh, countries that uh, were the co-hosts of this meeting, and uh, we look forward to the final preparatory meeting, which will be on the theme of protection of civilians and strategic communication. And that uh, last prep meeting will be co-hosted by Indonesia, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and Rwanda, and it will be held in Kigali on the 23rd and 24th of October. So just to say that in conclusion that um, uh, the meeting is, is particularly timely. Uh, peacekeeping operations are facing a number of challenges. Uh, the biggest challenges of all is the division uh, across our uh, member states and the fact that uh, this division uh, um, creates uh, a different political environment where those peacekeeping operations have less uh, political support and more importantly the political processes that are associated to each and every one of these missions are being less supported and certainly less unanimously uh, supported. But we also face other challenges uh, resulting from the evolution of conflict, uh, new uh, kind of threats, the, the use of uh, misinformation, disinformation, the uh, use or the impact of the negative use of uh, uh, digital technology, new form of attacks against our peacekeepers, and so on and so forth. And um, so we need more than ever partnership. And I think this meeting in Accra will be mostly about uh, not only continuing, but uh, reinforcing the very good partnership that we've had so far with our member states to do our best in order to address the challenges that we face and to keep the good work uh, because those peacekeeping operations, in spite of all the challenges that they face, make a difference every single day in terms of their protection, the protection that they bring to hundreds of thousands of civilians and uh, the uh, preservation of ceasefires. So um, we very much look forward to that meeting. And again, we thank Ghana for uh, its gracious uh, support and uh, hosting that meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let us now turn to the room for questions. Do we have any questions in the room? Yes, please. Uh, first, identify yourself, your media, and tell us who your question is addressed to. Thank you. Uh, my name is Toshi Inaba uh, from Kyoto News, Japanese Newswire. Uh, thank you for this uh, briefing at Medawase. Uh, in your one of your language, <laughs> and uh, of, I have two questions. One is uh, about peacekeeping, of course, and as you know, uh, 
uh, as we witnessed in Mali, uh, some of uh, UN peacekeeping operations are not so popular on the ground. And the UN also mentioned the, uh, the possibility of uh, peace enforcement from uh, provided by a uh, regional body like uh, AU. And, but I want to I wanna know how much are you committed to uh, do that? And if, if uh, resources, resources are allocated by the inter international communities, are you ready to take charge of uh, all the UN peacekeeping uh, operations in Africa? That's, that's one question. The other is uh, about, the, about this, the, the evaluation of all this general debate. Um, Western countries were paying attention that not, not to put much focus on the war in Ukraine, but that's what they said. Uh, did, you, uh, did you feel that other global challenges were uh, focused in the general debate enough? Thank you so much. You can answer right away. <clears throat> I will try to say a few words. Um, peacekeeping uh, can only work if there are a number of conditions that are associated to, uh, uh, or that are important to its success. Um, I think the most important one is that there has to be a, uh, a, politi a political process. Uh, the, the list of countries that were successfully supported by peacekeeping operation uh, in returning to stability uh, is long. Uh, these were countries where uh, you had a political process, a peace agreement. It was supported uh, in its implementation by peacekeeping, and uh, eventually peacekeeping operation left and left behind and improved situations. And the list of these countries, I'll say, goes from East Timor to uh, Liberia to uh, Cote d'Ivoire to uh, Angola, Mozambique, uh, Sierra Leone, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but that requires a, a united and committed support to our mem from our member states, from the Security Council in particular, to these political efforts. Now, we have a divided international community. It's more uh, difficult to obtain this kind of united and committed and strong support to these political efforts. And the result of that is that uh, most of the political processes that are associated to peacekeeping operations are not moving forward, or they're certainly not moving as fast as we would want. And so that leaves us with what, that leaves peacekeeping with what I call the intermediate goal of peacekeeping, which are very important. Protecting hundreds of thousands of civilians is very important per se, and protecting ceasefire, preventing uh, status quo from uh, uh, escalation or from uh, resumption of hostilities is very important, but that is, these are intermediate goals. And in some cases, you have what I call no peace to keep. I believe that was the case in Mali with these terrorist groups, and, uh, and we also uh, need the support and cooperation of the host government. If the host government decides that uh, it uh, does not uh, want a peacekeeping operation any more than we have to uh, uh, seek a different form of UN support to that country, which I believe will be the case in Mali. Now, peace enforcement, when uh, uh, the situation requires it, uh, is uh, different from peacekeeping. This isn't something that uh, the UN and certainly the Blue Helmet can do. I don't believe that we would ever have a mandate from the Security Council to do that, and uh, I don't think that we would have true contributing countries. This is why we are advocating for stronger support to peace enforcement operation, uh, which uh, need uh, not only a strong mandate from the Security Council, but which also need predictable funding, including in the form of assessed contribution. So these would be my attempt at answering that question. And of course, uh, I believe the other question was referring to the uh, situation in Ukraine. And uh, if I understood correctly, whether there is uh, some time a diversion of attention. Um, well, uh, uh, certainly we are uh, affected by uh, an increase in the number of conflict and 
conflict in Ukraine is an important one. It certainly uh, further exacerbates division, which uh, are impacting us. Uh, but I can tell you that there continues to be a very strong commitment, certainly from all of us uh, at the UN, to seek and pursue peace in the various situations in which peacekeeping operations are uh, deployed. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much. Um, just to add that I believe that um, peacekeeping missions have been very successful over the years. Um, Ghana has been involved or is present in nine out of the 12 missions out there. And um, the missions have, have, have done a lot of good um, in ensuring that the peace is kept, that citizens are kept safe. Um, the issue of um, peace enforcement um, is slightly different, and I'm sure that um, you are bringing that up because there's been some call um, by ECOWAS and, uh, and, and African uh, uh, countries, the African Union, um, to find ways to push out the uh, terrorist um, situation. Um, the terrorist sites that have um, that we find in, in in West Africa and the Sahel and in other areas, and it's quite clear that um, the, it won't be peacekeeping missions that will push them out, but it will be enforcement missions. And this is not um, asking the the the, the um, men and women in the blue berets to to be the ones to do that. Um, African countries, including ECOWAS, have said that um, we want assistance um, to be able to, to enforce um, the peace by pushing these people out. So we're not asking for um, the men in boots. We're not asking for boots on the ground. We're asking for assistance, and that is where the assets contributions um, have come in, where we're looking at predictable sources of funding and so this is um, a conversation that still continues. Um, and um, we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to make some headway um, with the United Nations and the countries that matter in terms of um, uh, giving the OK for access contributions. Because there's a need for predictable and sustainable um, sources of funding to be able to fight this menace that is plaguing us and, and creating a lot of confusion in, in Africa. Thank you. I know we are a little bit, pro oh, uh, Mr. Kari, did you want to add something? Just very quickly, uh, first and foremost, to thank Ghana for their contributions, which span from police to military to medical. Uh, and we are very grateful for all of them. Second, to inform that you are well aware that uh, the UN, through its office, UN Support Office in Somalia, supports directly the operational and logistically the African Union mission earlier on MISOM and ETMIS with a budget of nearly 551 million US dollars. Thank you. Thank you. And I know we are pressed for time because the minister has also other engagements. Uh, do we still have a few minutes to just maybe do a very quick blitz of questions? You had a question. I will take, we had someone online as well. Please, Thank you, we yes. will, I will take Thank a few you. questions and then we will answer all of them together. Thank you. Please go ahead. It's Maya Plants from the UN Brief from Geneva. The question is to uh, Mr. Lacroix is regarding the peacekeeping uh, mission in, for Haiti. Do you have a timeline for that? And uh, uh, yes, and perhaps uh, to know a bit more which countries are going to be contributing troops. Let me now just take one question from some journalists who are connected online. I will take a question from Kent Mensah from Asase Radio. If you can turn your microphone on and, and camera if possible. Let me just read the question. We're not able to hear, but I have the question. The question was, why was Ghana selected as the first in Africa to hold uh, this meeting? Let me, yes, please go ahead. And then I'll take another one, then we will get some answers. Well, my name is Sani Abdurrahman from Media General Ghana. I want to know how the growing 
divisions that we are seeing on the global stages undermining the peace keeping efforts and also the we are seeing groups like Wagner and cooperating in the Sahel and we are asking for resources to do more how is that also undermining efforts to ensure peace in the region thank you okay and yes go ahead Stephen Kojosaki I report for African Business Network Communications my question is what are the plans for United Nations in supporting uh, African ECOWAS peace arrangements that we have because uh, research has shown that when we have uh, enforcement within your region, we will be able to support peace operations. And then more so, what are the civil society's contribution to peace building and operations? Thank you. Thank you. I think we can get some answers. And if we have some additional time, I will take some more questions. You want to take it? Let's go ahead. You have a question? Go ahead. Thank you, madam, for your help. I'm Gorgi Wadundoi. I'm a Senegalese journalist in Geneva, Switzerland. I have two questions. First of all, I will raise it, the first one in French for Monsieur Lacroix. Monsieur Lacroix, uh, les missions de maintien de paix en Afrique connaissent une situation aujourd'hui très compliquée. Uh, Est-ce que c'est l'ONU qui n'écoute pas Ou bien est-ce qu'il est nécessaire aujourd'hui de changer de méthode de, de comment euh, les missions de maintien de la paix se passent en Afrique? Now the question in English: Are you in Africa to seek for a rebirth of UN peacekeeping operations regarding the bad images of these last years? Many countries. The second question, like Senegal are asking for a robust mandate of the peacekeeping. What is your comment on that? And the last one for Madam at the middle regarding women. We're talking about sexual harassment. I know that the UN Secretary General is talking a lot about zero tolerance. What are the main actions you took on the ground? Thank you. Okay, let's get some. Let's I get have some, follow let's up get, to these let's get, questions. Excuse me. Let's get some answers first. These were a lot of questions. Then we will go back to the room. Should we start with maybe with uh, Mr. Lacroix? Thank you. <clears throat> Very briefly, um, regarding Haiti, uh, as you know, there are currently discussion going on at the Security Council for the purpose of providing a mandate to uh, a support operation to the uh, stability in, uh, in Haiti. Uh, the objective is to provide a mandate to what would be a, a non-UN mission that would uh, uh, help uh, restore stability to this country, which is affected by very serious gang violence, and also provide support to the Haitian National Police. And parallel to that, there are efforts that are being made to uh, gather th um, the uh, capacities that would be needed for that operation. Kenya, as you know, has uh, uh, been coming forward to provide the lead uh, for this operation together with the 1,000 personnel. There are a number of other countries from the Caribbean that have uh, also uh, announced their readiness to, to, to uh, support and to contribute. Um, we are supportive of these efforts, so we, we, we hope that uh, this will uh, come to fruition soon because Haiti is, uh, and the Haitian population is suffering from this uh, very high level of violence. Uh, regarding why Ghana was selected, I think it's quite clear. Ghana is one of the uh, largest and, 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 and strongest supporter of peacekeeping and strongest one of the strongest uh, troop contributing countries to, to peacekeeping with an excellent record. And I believe that uh, really speaks for Ghana as uh, uh, a very uh, uh, legitimate country to, to host this first uh, meeting on peacekeeping in uh, a first ministerial level meeting on uh, peacekeeping in Africa. 
There was a question on, on regarding division of the um, amongst the uh, member states uh, and in the Security Council and how it affects our peacekeeping operation. I believe I already uh, answered that question. It is affecting us uh, significantly. We are seeing um, less mandates that are still extended by the Security Council, but with uh, less unanimity. And uh, of course, that is a signal that we, these missions will be less uh, strongly uh, supported from the political point of view. And I also mentioned the critical uh, uh, problem that, uh, that we're facing in terms of those uh, political processes uh, uh, having less support and less united support from member states. And of course, uh, regarding private security companies, uh, on the one hand, we uh, it is for each member state to choose their partner, and they can be, of course, private security company, but what we look at is whether it is impacting the mandate of peacekeeping operation in terms of their freedom of movement, in terms of their ability to, to continue implementing these mandates. This is really uh, the lens to which we look at that. Um, Africa, ECOWAS, uh, peace enforcement, I uh, already indicated what the EU position is, and as the, the minister uh, uh, recently indicated, we hope that there will be progress uh, on this important uh, file, um, uh, and, and we are fully supportive of these efforts, and Ghana is very much in the lead in the, in the Security Council. En français, euh, changer de méthode, je, bon, je crois que les, les opérations maintien de la paix doivent constamment s'adapter aux défis qu'elles rencontrent. Et je crois aussi que lorsqu'il y a des situations qui nécessitent d'autres méthodes, comme euh, l'imposition de la paix, on doit recourir à d'autres méthodes. Il ne s'agit pas de dire euh, hier c'était le maintien de la paix, aujourd'hui c'est l'imposition de la paix, demain ce sera autre, encore autre chose. Il s'agit d'avoir la gamme d'outils pour répondre aux situations de crise la plus adaptée, la plus diverse possible. C'est ça, euh, l'objectif. Uh, uh, and, uh, yes, and, and the, the question in, in, in English, uh, again, it, it's about, uh, the meeting in Ghana is about looking at ways in which we can constantly adapt and improve the effectiveness of peacekeeping, their capacities, their ability to uh, deliver on their mandate, of course, it's about situations where peacekeeping is uh, one of the adequate responses. It, it is never uh, a magic wand. It needs to be complemented by uh, other tools and other efforts, particularly in terms of supporting political processes. And, uh, and uh, again, it's, it's not either or, uh, either peacekeeping or in peace enforcement. It's really about what are the situations that we as, a, as an international community, we as the UN are, fa uh, are facing, and, and what is the best tool to respond to this uh, situation. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Minister, since you have just a few minutes left, I will give you the floor right away. Thank you very much. Um, why Ghana was selected, it has already been answered, but um, I just want to add that um, as a key member of the peacekeeping um, family, I've already said that out of the 12 missions, Ghana is present in nine of the 12 missions. Um, so we do have a stake um, when it comes to a ministerial meeting that is looking at addressing the gaps that um, that um, exist, and it, it's only proper, I believe, that we accept that invitation to host a meeting because um, we do have a lot of experience and expertise over the years. Uh, also, um, in addition to that, uh, our peacekeeping uh, missions involve a lot of women um, over the years, uh, and the numbers of our women have peacekeepers have increased a great deal. And um, just recently, um, a woman, um, um, Captain Cecilia Ezwa of Ghana, received the 2022 United Nations Military Gender Advocate of the Year Award. So for Ghana, there, there's a lot of um, reasons um, that we can give um, in terms of um, our capability and our, um, uh, our hosting of this meeting. Um, on civil society involvement in, in, in 
keeping the peace. I think this is extremely important. And um, it is very much uh, encouraged, and um, countries must ensure, and the UN also, um, I don't think, bars um, civil society from, from doing their bit. Um, on Wagner's, um, the supposed Wagner's involvement in some countries, really it's, it's, it's a decision that is taken by a country to bring in private security. And um, it, 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 has, it has played out. Um, and I can only attest to what has happened in, in a country that is within ECOWAS, which is Mali. Um, and I don't believe that um, the private security um, is able to keep the peace um, better than what the um, peacekeeping mission is able to do. And uh, indeed, um, the example that I've just given uh, probably shows that um, um, things have rather gotten worse. Um, but the, 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 the jury is still out on that, and I'm sure that um, eventually it will be very clear on the, the, the role, whether positive or negative. But it's up to the country to decide. But I believe that um, the UN is ready. Um, unfortunately, um, MINISMA is a drawdown on MINISMA. So we'll see what happens. Thank you. So I understand that we have two of our participants who have to uh, leave us now. But if it's OK with Mr. Lacroix and Mr. Carey, maybe we could take, there are so many questions, we could take two more. Let me, let me, let me first, hold on, let me first thank uh, Minister Botchway, Foreign Minister Botchway, for being with us today. Thank you so much. Ms. Pollard as well, thank you right, so can much. Can Ms. Pollard respond to the questions about uh, sexual exploitation and abuse? Who else so, well, well look, we'll work out something. Sorry. I'm so sorry. So let me just thank you so much. Uh, Let me go back to, I think we had two final questions. You had a question, Stefano, you also had a question. Do you want to start with your question? Yeah, thank you. For Mr. Lacroix, um, uh, two questions. One, would peacekeeping be involved in any pre-deployment training for a multinational force to Haiti? I know it's not peacekeeping troops, but uh, who would be involved in, in any pre-deployment training, including with SEA issues? Um, and then I have a second question for you. Uh, what about a minimum quota for uh, uh, female personnel from police and troop com uh, contributing member states? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, actually, in terms of training, uh, the answer is quite simple because we, as UN, we, we don't provide training directly. The member states provide training. What we do for peacekeeping operations is actually provide guidance and manual for training. So in the case of Haiti, obviously, it will be for uh, individual member states to provide uh, training to their respective uh, uh, troops and uh, uh, and uh, I understand that there are a number of countries that are already uh, available uh, to help in, in uh, providing that kind of training. So that's that's number one. Sorry, Inter just did, so did you mean the training materials or the guidance would still be provided by peacekeeping? If needed, we're ready to, I mean, if, if, if asked, of course, we'd be happy to provide some uh, support and then some advice. Um, of course, again, we're talking about something that is not peacekeeping because of the level of violence that currently uh, affects uh, Haiti, but uh, or obviously if we're being asked for advice uh, um, by uh, uh, any member state interested in participating uh, in that operation, then we'll be happy to provide any uh, relevant uh, advice. Um, in terms of uh, women in peacekeeping, uh, we first of all, we believe that uh, more women in peacekeeping means a more effective peacekeeping, and we have uh, abundant evidence on that on the ground. Uh, we have made a lot of progress in terms of the uh, uh, number uh, and, and, and the, also the enhancement of the role of women in peacekeeping, um, including in uh, senior positions. I believe that uh, we need to do more in three uh, areas. One is 
uh, we need to have more uh, women in senior positions, and the problem here is uh, resources. Uh, we need to have more senior uh, officers, female senior officers. We also need to have more uh, women in form military unit, where also we have an issue in terms of resources. I also believe that we need to do more in terms of making sure that the work environment for women peacekeeping is uh, welcoming. And, and here, uh, I think we uh, have more work to do, both in terms of the practical, if you will, facilities in, uh, in peacekeeping uh, setting, in peacekeeping environment. Um, and there's a lot that is being done with the support of uh, member states. Uh, LC Initiative is a very important tool for that. Uh, but we also need to work more so that the uh, human environment uh, is welcoming. In other words, that uh, make sure that there is full uh, mutual acceptance and tolerance uh, uh, for both for women and men in peacekeeping environment. So as you can see, there's more work to do in uh, along these lines. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take Stefano Dolci, and then we will wrap up. Yes, Stefano Vaccaro, La Voce di New York. This was a question also for the Foreign Minister of Ghana, but I, but I guess it's appropriate also for uh, Mr. Lacroix. Um, is the correlation between peacekeepers and I will call it uh, democracy keepers? So in the speech of the Secretary General uh, at the ANGA 78, he said that within countries, democracy is threatened, authoritarianism is on the rise. Uh, so my question for, for example, for the minister wo was, uh, if he was referring to country like, also like Ghana, that until a few years ago, they were considered, you know, democracy on the rise, but just in the last 48 hours, we had that, a lot of arrest in Accra for uh, just protesting. The people was protesting and there has been a lot of arrest. So, because you just mentioned that Ghana is one of those countries that contributed the best a force for the peacekeepers. My question is, when a country from democracy start to turn toward that authoritarianism, like uh, Secretary of State, say, the Secretary General say, is the UN turn the attention to, you know, does, means, my question is, do, does a country uh, to be a good fit for giving um, forces to the peacekeeper had to be a full democracy or a clause to be a good democracy, or if it turns to be a country different that treats its own people in a certain way, then doesn't fit anymore the role of peacekeepers. Let me take Dulcie's question right away. Uh, I actually have three questions. Sorry, Stephanie. Uh, I want to confirm that uh, the uh, withdrawal of MINUSMA is now, uh, they're able to use the uh, Niger border, which was not the uh, case uh, right after the coup. And uh, are you uh, saying uh, that UN peacekeeping is not going to be at all involved in this uh, multinational force led by Kenya in Haiti? And uh, given that your two largest peacekeeping missions, uh, Congo and Mali, are shutting down, what's the next model for peacekeeping, uh, at least in Africa? Thanks. Thank you. Would you like to go first? Let me answer only one question, because it is operational support, which deals with both establishment and withdrawal of operations. Insofar as the border between Mali and Niger is concerned, when I was in Mali, the prime minister and the foreign minister confirmed to me that that border was open in early August and continues to remain open. But that's not the point. We are concerned more about the border between Niger and Bena because we are not going to stay in Niger. We have to go back uh, to the port of Cotonou and then get out. I have had a discussion with the uh, uh, secretary general of ECOWAS, and then we will take it forward uh, uh, as we move. Uh, so that is the short answer that as of now, yes, border between Mali and Niger is open, but that alone is not a great help, uh, neither an impediment uh, to the departure of MINUSMA. Thank you. <clears throat> so regarding the uh, first question, um, I just want to, to recall that we, we have uh, 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 a screening system which is uh, 
quite uh, established, whereby we want to make sure that uh, those contingents and those uh, 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 officers, the personnel that we deployed in peacekeeping, uh, will not have been involved in violations of human rights. Uh, it's um, it's a time-consuming uh, uh, system, it's, uh, but it's an important mechanism, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, we um, you know, bring about uh, uh, the best possible result along these lines. Um, now, in terms of uh, UN peacekeeping not involving Haiti, yes, I mean, this is what uh, where we are uh, again. I mean, what is uh, currently uh, being discussed is a, a, a multinational operation, that is a non-UN uh, operation, uh, whose uh, potential mandate is currently discussed by uh, the Security Council. So I, that's uh, quite clear. Uh, now, regarding the last question, um, I believe that, uh, again, first, uh, if the host country, uh, like in the case of Mali, decide that it doesn't need any more, doesn't want any more peacekeeping operation, then we uh, have to uh, uh, draw appropriate consequences because the, no peacekeeping oper can operate without the support of the host country. Uh, we are uh, discussing with the Congolese authorities uh, with a view to uh, bringing about a gradual transition, a gradual but accelerated and transition uh, out of, uh, from MONUSCO out of uh, DR Congo. Um, I think that we, we have an agreement with the, the Congolese authorities that uh, this needs to take place in, in good conditions, uh, and, uh, uh, and we will uh, continue working with the Security Council and the Congolese authorities along this line. Now, um, we, um, we have, uh, I believe, uh, to look at, uh, again, what's, what is uh, the state of affairs for each specific situation. Uh, when uh, a peacekeeping operation uh, is uh, deployed uh, in a situation where we have a, a very uh, important regional dimension to the uh, situation that it has to deal with, and I believe that is the case uh, with the Great Lakes and the Eastern DRC, then uh, regional efforts are adequate to responding to what is, uh, to some extent, a, a regional conflict that doesn't fully speak its name. Um, but uh, each situation has to be looked at uh, uh, according to its own merit. And I think that it's important to uh, have in mind that, yes, on the one hand, one of the key challenges that we face currently is the fact that the political processes, I'm repeating myself, associated to peacekeeping operation are not moving forward for want of uh, strong and united political support from our member states. On the other hand, I believe that you also have to look at the alternative when looking at the uh, what a peacekeeping operation brings in terms of protection of civilian, in terms of preventing the resumption of hostilities, you have to look at, you know, is there an alternative? What if the peacekeeping operation leaves? Will it leave behind, will, will the resulting situation be better or worse? And I believe that uh, if you look at some instances in the recent past where peacekeeping operations were withdrawn for reason different from the full and successful completion of a political process, then I think you have uh, uh, it's an additional reason to look seriously at what the alternative is uh, uh, to a peacekeeping operation that uh, 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 is doing its best at least to protect as many civilians as possible and to prevent bad situation or worrying situation from becoming even worse. Thank you so much, and we will wrap up on this note. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for staying on and taking a few additional questions. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. No, thank you for staying.